You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. I'm back today with a second volume of Lovecraft Less Traveled. The first volume consisted of seven of the least listened to Lovecraft stories here on the Horror Babble YouTube channel. The second volume consists of another seven generally lesser known works. What do you think of these obscure gems, ladies and gents? Is one of them your favorite Lovecraft story? Or are these tales new to you? Chapter times can be found in the video description below. And without further ado. The Thing in the Moonlight by H. P. Lovecraft and J. Chapman Misk Letter to Donald Wandre My dreams occasionally approached the fantastical in character, though falling somewhat short of coherence. One scene is especially stamped upon my recollection, that of a dank, fetid, reed-choked marsh under a grey autumn sky with a rugged cliff of lichen-crusted stone rising to the north. Impelled by some obscure quest, I ascended a rift or cleft in this beetling precipice, noting as I did so the black mouths of many fearsome burrows extending from both walls into the depths of the stony plateau. At several points the passage was roofed over by the choking of the upper parts of the narrow fissure, these places being exceedingly dark, and forbidding the perception of such burrows as may have existed there. In one such dark space I felt conscious of a singular accession of fright, as if some subtle and bodiless emanation from the abyss were engulfing my spirit. But the blackness was too great for me to perceive the source of my alarm. At length I emerged upon a tableland of moss-grown rock and scanty soil, lit up by a faint moonlight which had replaced the expiring orb of day. Casting my eyes about, I beheld no living object, but was sensible of a very peculiar stirring far below me, amongst the whispering rushes of the pestilential swamp I had lately quitted. After walking for some distance, I encountered the rusty tracks of a street railway, and the worm-eaten poles which still held the limp, and sagging trolley wire. Following this line, I soon came upon a yellow, vestibuled car numbered 1852, of a plain, double-tracked type common from 1900 to 1910. It was untenanted, but evidently ready to start, the trolley being on the wire, and the air brake pump now and then throbbing beneath the floor. I boarded it, and looked vainly about for the light switch noting, as I did so, the absence of controller handle, which implied the brief absence of the motorman. Then I sat down in one of the cross-seats toward the middle, awaiting the arrival of the crew and the starting of the vehicle. Presently I heard a swishing in the sparse grass toward the left, and saw the dark forms of two men looming up in the moonlight. They had the regulation caps of a railway company, and I could not doubt but that they were the conductor and motorman. Then one of them sniffed with singular sharpness, and raised his face to howl to the moon. The other dropped on all fours to run toward the car. I leaped up at once, and raced madly out of that car and away across endless leagues of plateau, till exhaustion waked me, doing this not because the conductor had dropped on all fours, but because the face of the motorman was a mere white cone tapering to one blood-red tentacle. And now the story, The Thing in the Moonlight. Morgan is not a literary man. In fact, he cannot speak English with any degree of coherency. That is what makes me wonder about the words he wrote, though others have laughed. He was alone the evening it happened. Suddenly, an unconquerable urge to write came over him, 
and taking pen in hand, he wrote the following. My name is Howard Phillips. I live at 66 College Street in Providence, Rhode Island. On November 24th, 1927, for I know not even what the year may be now, I fell asleep and dreamed, since when I have been unable to awaken. My dream began in a dank, re-choked marsh that lay under a grey autumn sky, with a ragged cliff of lichen-crusted stone rising to the north. Impelled by some obscure quest, I ascended a rift or cleft in this beetling precipice, noting as I did so the black mouths of many fearsome burrows extending from both walls into the depths of the stony plateau. At several points the passage was roofed over by the choking of the upper parts of the narrow fissure, these places being exceedingly dark, and forbidding the perception of such burrows as may have existed there. In one such dark space I felt conscious of a singular accession of fright, as if some subtle and bodiless emanation from the abyss were engulfing my spirit but the blackness was too great for me to perceive the source of my alarm. At length I emerged upon a tableland of moss-grown rock and scanty soil, lit by a faint moonlight which had replaced the expiring orb of day. Casting my eyes about, I beheld no living object, but was sensible of a very peculiar stirring far below me, amongst the whispering rushes of the pestilential swamp I had lately quitted. After walking for some distance, I encountered the rusty tracks of a street railway, and the worm-eaten poles which still held the limp and sagging trolley wire. Following this line, I soon came upon a yellow, vestibuled car numbered 1852, of a plain, double-tracked type common from 1900 to 1910. It was untenanted, but evidently ready to start, the trolley being on the wire, and the air brake now and then throbbing beneath the floor. I boarded it, and looked vainly about for the light switch, noting as I did so the absence of the controller handle, which thus implied the brief absence of the motorman. Then I sat down in one of the cross-seats of the vehicle. Presently I heard a swishing in the sparse grass toward the left, and saw the dark forms of two men looming up in the moonlight. They had the regulation caps of a railway company, and I could not doubt but they were conductor and motorman. Then one of them sniffed with singular sharpness, and raised his face to howl to the moon. The other dropped on all fours to run toward the car— I leaped up at once, and raced madly out of that car and across endless leagues of plateau, till exhaustion forced me to stop, doing this not because the conductor had dropped on all fours, but because the face of the motorman was a mere white cone tapering to one blood-red tentacle. I was aware that I only dreamed, but the very awareness was not pleasant. Since that fearful night, I have prayed only for awakening. It has not come. Instead, I have found myself an inhabitant of this terrible dream world. That first night gave way to dawn, and I wandered aimlessly over the lonely swamplands. When night came, I still wandered, hoping for awakening. But suddenly— I parted the weeds and saw before me the ancient railway car, and to one side a cone-faced thing lifted its head, and in the streaming moonlight howled strangely. It has been the same each day. Night takes me always to that place of horror. I have tried not moving with the coming of nightfall, but I must walk in my slumber— for always I awaken with a thing of dread howling before me in the pale moonlight, and I turn and flee madly. God, when will I awaken? That 
is what Morgan wrote. I would go to 66 College Street in Providence, but I fear for what I might find there. The Terrible Old Man It was the design of Angelo Ricci and Joe Neck and Manuel Silva to call on the Terrible Old Man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea, and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Messrs. Ricci, Zanek, and Silver, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricci and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted, so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small-paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk, who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle— the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations, as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Neck and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard, who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane, and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow, whom everybody shunned, and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank, and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ricci, Zanek, and Silver selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ricci and Mr. Silver were to interview the poor old gentleman, whilst Mr. Zanek waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor-car in Ship Street, by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately— in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterward. Messrs. Ricci and Silver 
met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work, making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ricci and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window, and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Zanek as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor-car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently he consulted his watch, and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Zanek did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Zanek had never before noticed the colour of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot-heels which the tide washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor-car found in Ship Street— or certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal or migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain— must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. Till O'er the Seas, by H. P. Lovecraft and R. H. Barlow. 1. Upon an eroded cliff-top rested the man, gazing far across the valley. Lying thus, he could see a great distance, but in all the sheer expanse there was no visible motion. Nothing stirred the dusty plain, the disintegrated sand of long dry river beds, where once coursed the gushing streams of earth's youth. There was little greenery in this ultimate world, this final stage of mankind's prolonged presence upon the planet. 
For unnumbered eons the drought and sandstorms had ravaged all the lands. The trees and bushes had given way to small, twisted shrubs that persisted long through their sturdiness. But these in turn perished before the onslaught of coarse grasses and stringy, tough vegetation of strange evolution. The ever-present heat, as earth drew nearer to the sun, withered and killed with pitiless rays. It had not come at once. Long eons had gone before any could feel the change, and all through those first ages man's adaptable form had followed the slow mutation, and modelled itself to fit the more and more torrid air. Then the day had come when men could bear their hot cities but ill, and a gradual recession began, slow yet deliberate. Those towns and settlements closest to the equator had been first, of course, but later there were others. Man, softened and exhausted, could cope no longer with the ruthlessly mounting heat. It seared him as he was, and evolution was too slow to mould new resistances in him. Yet not at first were the great cities of the equator left to the spider and the scorpion. In the early years there were many who stayed on, devising curious shields and armours against the heat and the deadly dryness. These fearless souls, screening certain buildings against the encroaching sun, made miniature worlds of refuge, wherein no protective armour was needed. They contrived marvellously ingenious things, so that for a while men persisted in the rusting towers, hoping thereby to cling to old lands till the searing should be over. For many would not believe what the astronomers said, and looked for a coming of the mild olden world again. But one day the men of death, from the new city of Niyara, made signals to Yanaria, their immemorially ancient capital, and gained no answer from the few who remained therein. And when explorers reached that millennial city of bridge-linked towers, they found only silence. There was not even the horror of corruption, for the scavenger lizards had been swift. Only then did the people fully realize that these cities were lost to them, know that they must forever abandon them to nature. The other colonists in the hot lands fled from their brave posts, and total silence reigned within the high basalt walls of a thousand empty towns. Of the dense throngs and multitudinous activities of the past, nothing finally remained. There now loomed against the rainless deserts only the blistered towers of vacant houses, factories, and structures of every sort, reflecting the sun's dazzling radiance and parching in the more and more intolerable heat. Many lands, however, had still escaped the scorching blight, so that the refugees were soon absorbed in the life of a newer world. During strangely prosperous centuries, the hoary deserted cities of the equator grew half forgotten and entwined with fantastic fables. Few thought of those spectral, rotting towers, those huddles of shabby walls and cactus-choked streets, darkly silent and abandoned. Wars came, sinful and prolonged, but the times of peace were greater. Yet always the swollen sun increased its radiance as earth drew closer to its fiery parent. It was as if the planet meant to return to that source whence it was snatched, eons ago, through the accidents of cosmic growth. After a time, the blight crept outward from the central belt. Southern Urat burned as a tenantless desert, and then the north. In Parath and Balling, those ancient cities where brooding centuries dwelt, there moved only the scaly shapes of the serpent and the salamander, and at last Loten echoed only to the fitful falling of tottering spires and crumbling domes. Steady, universal, and inexorable was the great eviction of man from the realms he had always known. No land within the widening stricken belt was spared, no people left unrooted. It was an epic, a titan tragedy whose plot was unrevealed to the actors, this wholesale desertion of the cities of men. It took not years or even centuries, but millennia of ruthless change. 
and still it kept on, sullen, inevitable, savagely devastating. Agriculture was at a standstill. The world fast became too arid for crops. This was remedied by artificial substitutes, soon universally used, and as the old places that had known the great things of mortals were left, the loot salvaged by the fugitives grew smaller and smaller. Things of the greatest value and importance were left in dead museums, lost amid the centuries, and in the end the heritage of the immemorial past was abandoned. A degeneracy, both physical and cultural, set in with the insidious heat. For man had so long dwelt in comfort and security that this exodus from past scenes was difficult, nor were these events received phlegmatically. Their very slowness was terrifying. Degradation and debauchery were soon common. Government was disorganized, and the civilizations aimlessly slid back toward barbarism. When, forty-nine centuries after the blight from the equatorial belt, the whole western hemisphere was left unpeopled, chaos was complete. There was no trace of order or decency in the last scenes of this titanic, wildly impressive migration. Madness and frenzy stalked through them, and fanatics screamed of an Armageddon close at hand. Mankind was now a pitiful remnant of the elder races, a fugitive not only from the prevailing conditions, but from his own degeneracy. Into the Northland and the Antarctic went those who could. The rest lingered for years in an incredible saturnalia, vaguely doubting the forthcoming disasters. In the city of Borligo, a wholesale execution of the new prophets took place, after months of unfulfilled expectations. They thought the flight to the Northland unnecessary, and looked no longer for the threatened ending. How they perished must have been terrible indeed those vain, foolish creatures who thought to defy the universe. But the blackened, scorched towns are mute. These events, however, must not be chronicled, for there are larger things to consider than this complex and unhastening downfall of a lost civilization. During a long period, morale was at lowest ebb among the courageous few who settled upon the alien Arctic and Antarctic shores now mild as were those of southern Urat and the long-dead past. But here there was respite. The soil was fertile, and forgotten pastoral arts were called into use anew. There was, for a long time, a contented little epitome of the lost lands, though here were no vast throngs or great buildings. Only a sparse remnant of humanity survived the eons of change, and peopled those scattered villages, of the later world. How many millennia this continued is not known. The sun was slow in invading this last retreat, and as the eras passed there developed a sound, sturdy race, bearing no memories or legends of the old, lost lands. Little navigation was practised by this new people, and the flying machine was wholly forgotten. Their devices were of the simplest type and their culture was simple and primitive. Yet they were contented, and accepted the warm climate as something natural and accustomed. But unknown to these simple peasant folk, still further rigours of nature were slowly preparing themselves. As the generations passed, the waters of the vast and unplumbed ocean wasted slowly away, enriching the air and the desiccated soil, but sinking lower and lower each century. The splashing surf still glistened bright, and the swirling eddies were still there, but a doom of dryness hung over the whole watery expanse. However, the shrinkage could not have been detected save by instruments more delicate than any then known to the race. Even had the people realised the ocean's contraction, it is not likely that any vast alarm or great disturbance would have resulted, for the losses were so slight, and the sea so great. Only a few inches during many centuries, but in many centuries, 
increasing. So at last the oceans went, and water became a rarity on a globe of sun-baked drought. Man had slowly spread over all the Arctic and Antarctic lands. The equatorial cities, and many of later habitation, were forgotten even to legend. And now again the peace was disturbed, for water was scarce, and found only in deep caverns. There was little enough, even of this, and men died of thirst wandering in far places. Yet so slow were these deadly changes, that each new generation of man was loath to believe what it heard from its parents. None would admit that the heat had been less, or the water more plentiful, in the old days, or take warning that days of bitterer burning and drought were to come. Thus it was even at the end, when only a few hundred human creatures panted for breath beneath the cruel sun, a piteous huddled handful out of all the unnumbered millions who had once dwelt on the doomed planet. And the hundreds became small, till man was to be reckoned only in tens. These tens clung to the shrinking dampness of the caves, and knew at last that the end was near. So slight was their range, that none had ever seen the tiny, fabled spots of ice left close to the planet's poles, if such indeed remained. Even had they existed and been known to man, none could have reached them across the trackless and formidable deserts, and so the last pathetic few dwindled. It cannot be described, this awesome chain of events that depopulated the whole earth. The range is too tremendous for any to picture or encompass. Of the people of earth's fortunate ages, billions of years before, only a few prophets and madmen could have conceived that which was to come, could have grasped visions of the still, dead lands and long empty seabeds. The rest would have doubted, doubted alike the shadow of change upon the planet, and the shadow of doom upon the race. For man has always thought himself the immortal master of natural things. Two. When he had eased the dying pangs of the old woman, Ool wandered in a fearful daze out into the dazzling sands. She had been a fearsome thing, shriveled and so dry, like withered leaves. Her face had been the colour of the sickly yellow grasses that rustled in the hot wind, and she was loathsomely old. But she had been a companion, someone to stammer out vague fears to, to talk to about this incredible thing, a comrade to share one's hopes for succour from those silent other colonies beyond the mountains. He could not believe none lived elsewhere, for Ool was young, and not certain as are the old. For many years he had known none but the old woman. Her name was Maladna. She had come that day in his eleventh year, when all the hunters went to seek food, and did not return. Ool had no mother that he could remember, and there were few women in the tiny group. When the men vanished, those three women, the young one and the two old, had screamed fearfully and moaned long. Then the young one had gone mad and killed herself with a sharp stick. The old ones buried her in a shallow hole dug with their nails, so Ool had been alone when this still older Maladna came. She walked with the aid of a knotty pole, a priceless relic of the old forests, hard and shiny with years of use. She did not say when she came, but stumbled into the cabin while the young suicide was being buried. There she waited till the two returned, and they accepted her incuriously. That was the way it had been for many weeks, until the two fell sick, and Maladna could not cure them. Strange that those younger two should have been stricken, while she, infirm and ancient, lived on. Maladna had cared for them many days, and at length they died, so that Ool was left with only the stranger, 
he screamed all the night. So she became at length out of patience, and threatened to die too. Then, hearkening, he became quiet at once, for he was not desirous of complete solitude. After that, he lived with Melatna, and they gathered roots to eat. Melatna's rotten teeth were ill-suited to the food they gathered, but they contrived to chop it up till she could manage it. This weary routine of seeking and eating was Ool's childhood. Now he was strong and firm in his nineteenth year, and the old woman was dead. There was naught to stay for, so he determined at once to seek out those fabled huts beyond the mountains, and live with the people there. There was nothing to take on the journey. Ool closed the door of his cabin. Why, he could not have told, for no animals had been there for many years, and left the dead woman within. Half dazed and fearful at his own audacity, he walked long hours in the dry grasses, and at length reached the first of the foothills. The afternoon came, and he climbed until he was weary, and lay down on the grasses. Sprawled there, he thought of many things. He wondered at the strange life, passionately anxious to seek out the lost colony beyond the mountains. But at last, he slept. When he awoke, there was starlight on his face, and he felt refreshed. Now that the sun was gone for a time, he travelled more quickly, eating little, and determining to hasten before the lack of water became difficult to bear. He had brought none, for the last people, dwelling in one place, and never having occasion to bear their precious water away, made no vessels of any kind. Ool hoped to reach his goal within a day, and thus escape thirst. So he hurried on beneath the bright stars, running at times in the warm air, and at other times lapsing into a dog-trot. So he continued, until the sun arose. Yet still he was within the small hills, with three great peaks looming ahead. In their shade he rested again, then he climbed all the morning, and at midday surmounted the first peak, where he lay for a time, surveying the space before the next range. Upon an eroded cliff-top rested the man, gazing far across the valley. Lying thus, he could see a great distance, but in all the sheer expanse there was no visible motion. The second night came, and found Ool amid the rough peaks, the valley and the place where he had rested far behind. He was nearly out of the second range now, and hurrying still. Thirst had come upon him that day, and he regretted his folly, yet he could not have stayed there with the corpse, alone in the grasslands. He sought to convince himself thus, and hastened ever on, tiredly straining. And now there were only a few steps before the cliff wall would part and allow a view of the land beyond. Ool stumbled wearily down the stony way, tumbling and bruising himself even more. It was nearly before him, this land where men were rumoured to have dwelt, this land of which he had heard tales in his youth. The way was long, but the goal was great. A boulder of giant circumference cut off his view. Upon this he scrambled anxiously. Now at last, he could behold by the sinking orb his long-sought destination, and his thirst and aching muscles were forgotten, as he saw joyfully that a small huddle of buildings clung to the base of the farther cliff. Ool rested not, but, spurred on by what he saw, ran and staggered and crawled the half-mile remaining. He fancied that he could detect forms among the rude cabins. The sun was nearly gone, the hateful, devastating sun that had slain humanity. He could not be sure of details, but soon the cabins were near. They were very old, for clay blocks lasted long in the still dryness of the dying world. Little indeed changed but the living things, the grasses and these last men. Before him an open door swung upon rude pegs, in the fading light, Ool entered, 
weary unto death, seeking painfully the expected faces. Then he fell upon the floor and wept, for at the table was propped a dry and ancient skeleton. He rose at last, crazed by thirst, aching unbearably, and suffering the greatest disappointment any mortal could know. He was, then, the last living thing upon the globe. Is the heritage of the earth, all the lands and all to him equally useless. He staggered up, not looking at the dim white form in the reflected moonlight, and went through the door. About the empty village he wandered, searching for water and sadly inspecting this long empty place so spectrally preserved by the changeless air. Here there was a dwelling, there a rude place where things had been made, clay vessels holding only dust, and nowhere any liquid to quench his burning thirst. Then, in the centre of the little town, Ull saw a well curb. He knew what it was, for he had heard tales of such things from Maladna. With pitiful joy, he reeled forward and leaned upon the edge. There, at last, was the end of his search. Water, slimy, stagnant, and shallow, but water before his sight. Ull cried out in the voice of a tortured animal, groping for the chain and bucket. His hand slipped on the slimy edge, and he fell upon his chest across the brink. For a moment he lay there. Then, soundlessly, his body was precipitated down the black shaft. There was a slight splash in the murky shallowness as he struck some long sunken stone, dislodged eons ago from the massive coping. The disturbed water subsided into quietness, and now at last the earth was dead. The final, pitiful survivor had perished. All the teeming billions, the slow eons, the empires and civilizations of mankind were summed up in this poor, twisted form, and how titanically meaningless it had all been. Now, indeed, had come an end and climax to all the efforts of humanity. How monstrous and incredible a climax in the eyes of those poor, complacent fools of the prosperous days! Not ever again would the planet know the thunderous tramping of human millions, or even the crawling of lizards and the buzz of insects, for they too had gone. Now was come the rain of sapless branches and endless fields of tough grasses. Earth, like its cold, imperturbable moon, was given over to silence and blackness forever. The stars whirred on. The whole careless plan would continue for infinities unknown. This trivial end of a negligible episode mattered not to distant nebulae or to suns newborn, flourishing, and dying. The race of man, too puny and momentary to have a real function or purpose, was as if it had never existed. To such a conclusion, the eons of its farcically toilsome evolution had led. But when the deadly sun's first rays darted across the valley, a light found its way to the weary face of a broken figure that lay in the slime. THE OTHER GODS Atop the tallest of earth's peaks dwell the gods of earth, and suffer no man to tell that he hath looked upon them. Lesser peaks they once inhabited, but ever the men from the plains would scale the slopes of rock and snow, driving the gods to higher and higher mountains, till now only the last remains. When they left their older peaks they took with them all signs of themselves, save once, it is said, when they left a carven image on the face of the mountain, which they called Grenek. But now they have betaken themselves to unknown Kadath in the cold waste, 
where no man treads, and are grown stern, having no higher peak whereto to flee at the coming of men. They are grown stern, and where once they suffered men to displace them, they now forbid men to come, or coming, to depart. It is well for men that they know not of Kadath and the cold waste, else they would seek injudiciously to scale it. Sometimes, when earth's gods are homesick, they visit in the still night the peaks where once they dwelt, and weep softly as they try to play in the olden way on remembered slopes. Men have felt the tears of the gods on white-capped Thuri, though they have thought it rain, and have heard the sighs of the gods in the plaintive dawn-winds of Lerion. In cloud-ships the gods are wont to travel, and wise quarters have legends that keep them from certain high peaks at night, when it is cloudy, for the gods are not lenient as of old. In Althar, which lies beyond the river sky, once dwelt an old man avid to behold the gods of earth, a man deeply learned in the seven cryptical books of San, and familiar with the narcotic manuscripts of distant and frozen Lomar. His name was Barzai the Wise, and the villagers tell of how he went up a mountain on the night of the strange eclipse. Barzai knew so much of the gods that he could tell of their comings and goings, and guess so many of their secrets, that he was deemed half a god himself. It was he who wisely advised the Burgesses of Ulthar, when they passed their remarkable law against the slaying of cats, and who first told the young priest to tell where it is that black cats go at midnight on St. John's Eve. Barzai was learned in the lore of earth's gods, and had gained a desire to look upon their faces. He believed that his great secret knowledge of gods could shield him from their wrath, so resolved to go up to the summit of high and rocky Hathegkla, on a night when he knew the gods would be there. Hathegkla is far in the stony desert beyond Hatheg, for which it is named and rises like a rock statue in a silent temple. Around its peak the mists play always mournfully, for mists are the memories of the gods, and the gods loved Hathegkla when they dwelt upon it in the old days. Often the gods of earth visit Hathegkla in their ships of cloud, casting pale vapours over the slopes as they dance reminiscently on the summit, under a clear moon. The villagers of Hatheg say it is ill to climb Hathegklar at any time, and deadly to climb it by night when pale vapours hide the summit and the moon. But Barzai heeded them not when he came from neighbouring Althar with the young priest Atul, who was his disciple. Atul was only the son of an innkeeper, and was sometimes afraid, but Barzai's father had been a landgrave who dwelt in an ancient castle, so he had no common superstition in his blood and only laughed at the fearful cotters. Barzai and Atul went out of Hathag into the stony desert, despite the prayers of peasants, and talked of earth's gods by their campfires at night. Many days they travelled, and from afar saw lofty Hathag Kla, with his aureole of mournful mist. On the thirteenth day they reached the mountain's lonely base, and Atul spoke of his fears. But Barzai was old and learned, and had no fears, so led the way, boldly up the slope that no man had scaled since the time of Sansu, who was written of with fright in the mouldy narcotic manuscripts. The way was rocky, and made perilous by chasms, cliffs, and falling stones. Later it grew cold and snowy, and Barzai and Atal often slipped and fell as they hewed and plodded upward with staves and axes. Finally the air grew thin, and the sky changed colour, and the climbers found it hard to breathe, but still they toiled up and up, marvelling at the strangeness of the scene, and thrilling at the thought of what would happen on the summit, when the moon was out and the pale vapours spread around. For three days they climbed higher, higher, and higher toward the roof of the world, then they camped to wait for the clouding of the moon. For four nights no clouds came, and the moon shone down cold through the thin mournful mists around the silent pinnacle. Then, on the fifth night, which was the night of the full moon, Barzai saw some dense clouds far to the north, 
and stayed up with the tull to watch them draw near. Thick and majestic they sailed, slowly and deliberately onward, ranging themselves round the peak high above the watchers, and hiding the moon and the summit from view. For a long hour the watchers gazed, whilst the vapours swirled and the screen of clouds grew thicker and more restless. Barzai was wise in the law of earth's gods, and listened hard for certain sounds, but Atal felt the chill of the vapours and the awe of the night, and feared much. And when Barzai began to climb higher, and beckon eagerly, it was long before a tull would follow. So thick were the vapours that the way was hard, and though a tull followed on at last, he could scarce see the grey shape of Barzai on the dim slope above, in the clouded moonlight. Barzai forged very far ahead, and seemed despite his age to climb more easily than a tull, fearing not the steepness that began to grow too great for any, save a strong and dauntless man, nor pausing at wide black chasms that a tull scarce could leap. And so they went up wildly, over rocks and gulfs, slipping and stumbling, and sometimes awed at the vastness and horrible silence of bleak ice pinnacles and mute granite steeps. Very suddenly, Barzai went out of Atal's sight, scaling a hideous cliff that seemed to bulge outward and block the path for any climber not inspired of earth's gods. Atal was far below, and planning what he should do when he reached the place, when, curiously, he noticed that the light had grown strong, as if the cloudless peak and moonlit meeting-place of the gods were very near and as he scrambled on toward the bulging cliff and litten sky, he felt fears more shocking than any he had known before. Then through the high mists he heard the voice of unseen Barzai, shouting wildly in delight, I have heard the gods! I have heard Earth's gods singing in revelry on Hathekla! The voices of Earth's gods are known to Barzai the prophet! The mists are thin, and the moon is bright! and I shall see the gods dancing wildly on Hathekla that they loved in youth. The wisdom of Barzai hath made him greater than earth's gods, and against his will their spells and barriers are as naught. Barzai will behold the gods, the proud gods, the secret gods, the gods of earth who spurn the sight of men. Atal could not hear the voices Barzai heard, but he was now close to the bulging cliff, and scanning it for footholds. Then he heard Barzai's voice grow shriller and louder. The mists are very thin, and the moon casts shadows on the slope. The voices of Earth's gods are high and wild, and they fear the coming of Barzai the wise, who is greater than they. The moon's light flickers as Earth's gods dance against it. I shall see the dancing forms of the gods that leap and howl in the moonlight. The light is dimmer, and the gods are afraid!" Whilst Barzai was shouting these things, Atal felt a spectral change in the air, as if the laws of earth were bowing to greater laws. For though the way was steeper than ever, the upward path was now grown fearsomely easy, and the bulging cliff proved scarce an obstacle when he reached it, and slid perilously up its convex face. The light of the moon had strangely failed, and as Atal plunged upward through the mists, he heard Barzai the wise shrieking in the shadows, The moon is dark, and the gods dance in the night. There is terror in the sky, for upon the moon hath sunk an eclipse foretold in no books of men or of earth's gods. There is unknown magic on Hathekla, for the screams of the frightened gods have turned to laughter and the slopes of ice shoot up endlessly into the black heavens, whither I am plunging. I, I, at last, in the dim light I behold the gods of earth! And now Atal, slipping dizzily up over inconceivable steeps, heard in the dark a loathsome laughing, mixed with such a cry as no man else ever heard, save in the phlegathorn of unrelatable nightmares a cry wherein reverberated the horror and anguish of a haunted lifetime packed into one atrocious moment. The other gods! The other gods! 
the gods of the outer hells that guard the feeble gods of earth. Look away, go back, do not see, do not see the vengeance of the infinite abysses and that cursed, that damnable pit. Merciful gods of earth, I am falling into the sky. And as Atal shut his eyes and stopped his ears and tried to jump downward against the frightful pull from unknown heights, there resounded on Hathegla that terrible peal of thunder which awaked the good quarters of the plains, and the honest burgesses of Hatheg and Deer and Althar, and caused them to behold through the clouds that strange eclipse of the moon that no book ever predicted. And when the moon came out at last, Atoll was safe on the lower snows of the mountain, without sight of earth's gods, or of the other gods. Now it is told in the mouldy narcotic manuscripts that Sansu found naught but wordless ice and rock when he climbed Hatheg Klar in the youth of the world. Yet when the men of Althar and Nier and Hatheg crushed their fears and scaled that haunted steep by day in search of Barzai the wise, they found graven in the naked stone of the summit a curious encyclopean symbol fifty cubits wide as if the rock had been riven by some titanic chisel. And the symbol was like to one that learned men have discerned in those frightful parts of the narcotic manuscripts which are too ancient to be read. This they found. Barzai the wise they never found, nor could the holy priest at Tull ever be persuaded to pray for his soul's repose. Moreover, to this day the people of Althar and Nier and Hatheg fear eclipses, and pray by night when pale vapours hide the mountain top and the moon. And above the mists on Hatheg Klar, earth's gods sometimes dance reminiscently, for they know they are safe, and love to come from unknown Kadath in ships of cloud, and play in the olden way, as they did when earth was new, and men not given to the climbing of inaccessible places. The Green Meadow by H. P. Lovecraft and Winifred V. Jackson Introductory Note The following very singular narrative, or record of impressions, was discovered under circumstances so extraordinary that they deserve careful description. On the evening of Wednesday, August 27, 1913, at about 8.30 o'clock, the population of the small seaside village of Pottawonket, Maine, USA, was aroused by a thunderous report accompanied by a blinding flash, and persons near the shore beheld a mammoth ball of fire dart from the heavens into the sea but a short distance out, sending up a prodigious column of water. The following Sunday, a fishing party composed of John Richmond, Peter B. Carr, and Simon Canfield caught in their trawl and dragged ashore a mass of metallic rock weighing three hundred and sixty pounds, and looking, as Mr. Canfield said, like a piece of slag. Most of the inhabitants agreed that this heavy body was none other than the fireball which had fallen from the sky four days before, and Dr. Richmond M. Jones, the local scientific authority, allowed that it must be an aerolite or meteoric stone. In chipping off specimens to send to an expert Boston analyst, Dr. Jones discovered, embedded in the semi-metallic mass, the strange book containing the ensuing tale, which is still in his possession. In form, the discovery resembles an ordinary notebook, about five by three inches in size, and containing thirty leaves. In material, however, it presents marked peculiarities. The covers are apparently of some dark stony substance unknown to geologists, and unbreakable by any mechanical means. No chemical reagent seems to act upon them. The leaves are much the same, save that they are lighter in colour, and so infinitely thin as to be quite flexible. The whole is bound by some process not very clear to those who have observed it. 
a process involving the adhesion of the leaf substance to the cover substance. These substances cannot now be separated, nor can the leaves be torn by any amount of force. The writing is Greek of the purest classical quality, and several students of paleography declare that the characters are in a cursive hand used about the second century BC. There is little in the text to determine the date. The mechanical mode of writing cannot be deduced, beyond the fact that it must have resembled that of the modern slate and slate pencil. During the course of analytical efforts made by the late Professor Chambers of Harvard, several pages, mostly at the conclusion of the narrative, were blurred to the point of utter effacement before being read, a circumstance forming a well-nigh irreparable loss. What remains of the contents was done into modern Greek letters by the paleographer Rutherford, and in this form submitted to the translators. Professor Mayfield of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who examined samples of the strange stone, declares it a true meteorite, an opinion in which Dr. von Winterfeld of Heidelberg, interned in 1918 as a dangerous enemy alien, does not concur. Professor Bradley of Columbia College adopts a less dogmatic ground, pointing out that certain utterly unknown ingredients are present in large quantities, and warning that no classification is as yet possible. The presence, nature, and message of the strange book form so momentous a problem that no explanation can even be attempted. The text, as far as preserved, is here rendered as literally as our language permits, in the hope that some reader may eventually hit upon an interpretation and solve one of the greatest scientific mysteries of recent years. Translated by Elizabeth Neville Berkeley and Louis Theobald, Jr. The Story It was a narrow place, and I was alone. On one side, beyond a margin of vivid waving green, was the sea, blue, bright, and billowy, and sending up vaporous exhalations which intoxicated me, so profuse indeed were these exhalations, that they gave me an odd impression of a coalescence of sea and sky, for the heavens were likewise bright and blue. On the other side was the forest, ancient almost as the sea itself, and stretching infinitely inland. It was very dark, for the trees were grotesquely huge and luxuriant, and incredibly numerous. Their giant trunks were of a horrible green, which blended weirdly with the narrow green tract whereon I stood. At some distance away, on either side of me, the strange forest extended down to the water's edge, obliterating the shoreline, and completely hemming in the narrow tract. Some of the trees, I observed, stood in the water itself, as though impatient of any barrier to their progress. I saw no living thing nor sign that any living thing save myself had ever existed. The sea and the sky and the wood encircled me, and reached off into regions beyond my imagination. Nor was there any sound, save of the wind-tossed wood and of the sea. As I stood in this silent place, I suddenly commenced to tremble, for though I knew not how I came there, and could scarce remember what my name and rank had been, I felt that I should go mad if I could understand what lurked about me. I recalled things I had learned, things I had dreamed, things I had imagined and yearned for in some other distant life. I thought of long nights when I had gazed up at the stars of heaven, and cursed the gods that my free soul could not traverse the vast abysses which were inaccessible to my body. I conjured up ancient blasphemies, and terrible delvings into the papyri of Democritus. But as memories appeared, I shuddered in deeper fear, for I knew that I was alone, horribly alone. Alone, yet close to sentient impulses of vast, vague kind, which I prayed never to comprehend nor encounter. In the voice of the swaying green branches, I fancied I could detect a kind of malignant hatred and demoniac triumph. Sometimes they struck me as being in horrible colloquy with ghastly and unthinkable things which the scaly green bodies of the trees half hid, hid from sight, but not from consciousness. 
The most oppressive of my sensations was a sinister feeling of alienage. Though I saw about me objects which I could name, trees, grass, sea, and sky, I felt that their relation to me was not the same as that of the trees, grass, sea, and sky I knew in another and dimly remembered life. The nature of the difference I could not tell, yet I shook in stark fright as it impressed itself upon me. And then, in a spot where I had before discerned nothing but the misty sea, I beheld the green meadow, separated from me by a vast expanse of blue rippling water, with sun-tipped wavelets yet strangely near. Often I would peep fearfully over my right shoulder at the trees, but I preferred to look at the green meadow, which affected me oddly. It was while my eyes were fixed upon this singular tract, that I first felt the ground in motion beneath me, beginning with a kind of throbbing agitation which held a fiendish suggestion of conscious action, the bit of bank on which I stood detached itself from the grassy shore, and commenced to float away, borne slowly onward, as if by some current of resistless force. I did not move, astonished and startled as I was by the unprecedented phenomenon, but stood rigidly still until a wide lane of water yawned betwixt me and the land of trees. Then I sat down in a sort of daze, and again looked at the sun-tipped water and the green meadow. Behind me, the trees and the things they may have been hiding seemed to radiate infinite menace. This I knew without turning to view them, for as I grew more used to the scene, I became less and less dependent upon the five senses that once had been my sole reliance. I knew the green scaly forest hated me, yet now I was safe from it, for my bit of bank had drifted far from the shore. But though one peril was past, another loomed up before me. Pieces of earth were constantly crumbling from the floating isle which held me, so that death could not be far distant in any event. Yet even then I seemed to sense that death would be death to me no more, for I turned again to watch the green meadow, imbued with a curious feeling of security, in strange contrast to my general horror. Then it was that I heard, at a distance immeasurable, the sound of falling water. Not that of any trivial cascade such as I had known, but that which might be heard in the far Scythian lands, if all the Mediterranean were poured down an unfathomable abyss. It was toward this sound that my shrinking island was drifting. Yet I was content. Far in the rear were happening weird and terrible things, things which I turned to view, yet shivered to behold. For in the sky dark vaporous forms hovered fantastically, brooding over trees and seeming to answer the challenge of the waving green branches. Then a thick mist arose from the sea to join the sky forms, and the shore was erased from my sight. Though the sun, what sun, I knew not, shone brightly on the water around me, the land I had left seemed involved in a demoniac tempest, where clashed the will of the hellish trees, and what they hid with that of the sky and the sea. And when the mist vanished, I saw only the blue sky and the blue sea, for the land and the trees were no more. It was at this point that my attention was arrested by the singing in the green meadow. Hitherto, as I have said, I had encountered no sign of human life, but now there arose to my ears a dull chant, whose origin and nature were apparently unmistakable. While the words were utterly undistinguishable, the chant awaked in me a peculiar train of associations, and I was reminded of some vaguely disquieting lines I had once translated out of an Egyptian book, which in turn were taken from a papyrus of ancient Meroe. Through my brain ran lines that I fear to repeat, lines telling of very antique things, and forms of life in the days when our earth was exceeding young, of things which thought and moved and were alive, yet which gods and men would not consider alive. It was a strange book. 
As I listened, I became gradually conscious of a circumstance which had before puzzled me only subconsciously. At no time had my sight distinguished any definite objects in the green meadow, an impression of vivid homogeneous verdure being the sum total of my perception. Now, however, I saw that the current would cause my island to pass the shore at but a little distance, so that I might learn more of the land and of the singing thereon. My curiosity to behold the singers had mounted high, though it was mingled with apprehension. Bits of sod continued to break away from the tiny tract which carried me, but I heeded not their loss, for I felt that I was not to die with the body, or appearance of a body, which I seemed to possess. That everything about me, even life and death, was illusory, that I had overleaped the bounds of mortality and corporeal entity, becoming a free, detached thing, impressed me as almost certain. Of my location I knew nothing, save that I felt I could not be on the earth planet once so familiar to me. My sensations, apart from a kind of haunting terror, were those of a traveller just embarked upon an unending voyage of discovery. For a moment I thought of the lands and persons I had left behind, and of strange ways whereby I might some day tell them of my adventurings, even though I might never return. I had now floated very near the green meadow, so that the voices were clear and distinct, but though I knew many languages, I could not quite interpret the words of the chanting. Familiar they indeed were, as I had subtly felt when at a greater distance, but beyond a sensation of vague and awesome remembrance, I could make nothing of them. A most extraordinary quality in the voices, a quality which I cannot describe, at once frightened and fascinated me. My eyes could now discern several things amidst the omnipresent verdure. Rocks covered with bright green moss, shrubs of considerable height, and less definable shapes of great magnitude, which seemed to move or vibrate amidst the shrubbery in a peculiar way. The chanting, whose authors I was so anxious to glimpse, seemed loudest at points where these shapes were most numerous, and most vigorously in motion. And then, as my island drifted closer, and the sound of the distant waterfall grew louder, I saw clearly the source of the chanting, and in one horrible instant remembered everything. Of such things I cannot, dare not tell, for therein was revealed the hideous solution of all which had puzzled me, and that solution would drive you mad even as it almost drove me. I knew now the change through which I had passed, and through which certain others who once were men had passed, and I knew the endless cycle of the future which none like me may escape. I shall live forever, be conscious forever, though my soul cries out to the gods for the boon of death and oblivion. All is before me. Beyond the deafening torrent lies the land of Stethalos, where young men are infinitely old. The green meadow, I will send a message across the horrible, immeasurable abyss. At this point, the text becomes illegible. THE ALCHEMIST High up, crowning the grassy summit of a swelling mound whose sides are wooded near the base with the gnarled trees of the primeval forest, stands the old chateau of my ancestors. For centuries its lofty battlements have frowned down upon the wild and rugged countryside about, serving as a home and stronghold for the proud house whose honoured line is older even than the moss-grown castle walls. These ancient turrets, stained by the storms of generations, and crumbling under the slow yet mighty pressure of time, formed in the ages of feudalism one of the most dreaded and formidable fortresses in all France. From its machicolated parapets and 
Mounted battlements, barons, counts, and even kings have been defied, yet never had its spacious halls resounded to the footsteps of the invader. But since those glorious years all is changed, a poverty but little above the level of dire want, together with a pride of name that forbids its alleviation by the pursuits of commercial life, have prevented the scions of our line from maintaining their estates in pristine splendour, and the falling stones of the walls, the overgrown vegetation in the parks, the dry and dusty moat, the ill-paved courtyards and toppling towers without, as well as the sagging floors, the worm-eaten wainscots, and the faded tapestries within, all tell a gloomy tale of fallen grandeur. As the ages passed, first one, then another of the four great turrets were left to ruin, until at last but a single tower housed the sadly reduced descendants of the once mighty lords of the estate. It was in one of the vast and gloomy chambers of this remaining tower that I, Antoine, last of the unhappy and accursed Comte de C, first saw the light of day ninety long years ago. Within these walls, and amongst the dark and shadowy forests, the wild ravines and grottoes of the hillside below were spent the first years of my troubled life. My parents I never knew. My father had been killed at the age of thirty-two, a month before I was born, by the fall of a stone somehow dislodged from one of the deserted parapets of the castle, and my mother having died at my birth, my care and education devolved solely upon one remaining servitor, an old and trusted man of considerable intelligence, whose name I remember as Pierre. I was an only child, and the lack of companionship which this fact entailed upon me was augmented by the strange care exercised by my aged guardian in excluding me from the society of the peasant children, whose abodes were scattered here and there upon the plains that surround the base of the hill. At the time, Pierre said that this restriction was imposed upon me, because my noble birth placed me above association with such plebeian company. Now I know that its real object was to keep from my ears the idle tales of the dread curse upon our line, that were nightly told and magnified by the simple tenantry as they conversed in hushed accents in the glow of their cottage hearths. Thus isolated, and thrown upon my own resources, I spent the hours of my childhood in poring over the ancient tomes that filled the shadow-haunted library of the chateau, and in roaming without aim or purpose through the perpetual dusk of the spectral wood that clothes the side of the hill near its foot. It was perhaps an effect of such surroundings that my mind early acquired a shade of melancholy, those studies and pursuits which partake of the dark and occult in nature most strongly claimed my attention. Of my own race I was permitted to learn singularly little, yet what small knowledge of it I was able to gain seemed to depress me much. Perhaps it was at first only the manifest reluctance of my old preceptor to discuss with me my paternal ancestry that gave rise to the terror which I ever felt at the mention of my great house. Yet, as I grew out of childhood, I was able to piece together disconnected fragments of discourse, let slip from the unwilling tongue which had begun to falter in approaching senility, that had a sort of relation to a certain circumstance which I had always deemed strange, but which now became dimly terrible. The circumstance to which I allude is the early age at which all the Comte of my line had met their end. Whilst I had hitherto considered this but a natural attribute of a family of short-lived men, I afterward pondered long upon these premature deaths, and began to connect them with the wanderings of the old man, who often spoke of a curse which for centuries had prevented the lives of the holders of my title from much exceeding the span of thirty-two years. Upon my twenty-first birthday, the aged Pierre gave to me a family document, which he said had, for many generations, been handed down from father to son, and continued by each possessor. Its contents were of the most startling nature, and its perusal confirmed the gravest of my apprehensions. At this time, my belief in the supernatural was firm and deep-seated, else I should have dismissed with scorn the incredible narrative unfolded before my eyes. The paper carried me back to the days of the thirteenth century, when the old castle in which I sat had been a feared and impregnable fortress. It told of a certain ancient man, who had once dwelt on our estates, a person of no small accomplishments, 
though little above the rank of peasant, by name Michel, usually designated by the surname of Mouvet the Evil, on account of his sinister reputation. He had studied beyond the custom of his kind, seeking such things as the Philosopher's Stone, or the elixir of eternal life, and was reputed wise in the terrible secrets of black magic and alchemy. Michel Mouvet had one son, named Charles, a youth as proficient as himself in the hidden arts, and who had therefore been called Le Sorcier, or the Wizard. This pair, shunned by all honest folk, were suspected of the most hideous practices. Old Michel was said to have burnt his wife alive as a sacrifice to the devil, and the unaccountable disappearances of many small peasant children were laid at the dreaded door of these two. Yet, through the dark natures of the father and the son, ran one redeeming ray of humanity. The evil old man loved his offspring with fierce intensity, whilst the youth had for his parent a more than filial affection. One night, the castle on the hill was thrown into the wildest confusion, by the vanishment of young Godfrey, son to Henri the Comte. The searching party, headed by the frantic father, invaded the cottage of the sorcerers, and there came upon old Michel Mouvet, busy over a huge and violently boiling cauldron. Without certain cause, in the ungoverned madness of fury and despair, the Comte laid hands on the aged wizard, and ere he released his murderous hold, his victim was no more. Meanwhile, joyful servants were proclaiming the finding of young Godfrey in a distant and unused chamber of the great edifice, telling too late that poor Michel had been killed in vain. As the Comte and his associates turned away from the lowly abode of the alchemists, the form of Charles Le Sorcier appeared through the trees. The excited chatter of the menials standing about told him what had occurred, yet he seemed at first unmoved at his father's fate. Then, slowly advancing to meet the Comte, he pronounced in dull yet terrible accents the curse that ever afterward haunted the house of C. May never a noble of thy murderous line survive to reach a greater age than thine, spake he, when, suddenly leaping backwards into the black wood, he drew from his tunic a phial of colourless liquid, which he threw into the face of his father's slayer, as he disappeared behind the inky curtain of the night. The Comte died without utterance, and was buried the next day, but little more than two and thirty years from the hour of his birth. No trace of the assassin could be found, their relentless bands of peasants scoured the neighbouring woods in the meadowland around the hill. Thus time and the want of a reminder dulled the memory of the curse in the minds of the late Comte's family, so that when Godfrey, innocent cause of the whole tragedy and now bearing the title, was killed by an arrow whilst hunting at the age of thirty-two, there were no thoughts save those of grief at his demise. But when, years afterward, the next young Comte, Robert by name, was found dead in a nearby field from no apparent cause. The peasants told in whispers that their seigneur had but lately passed his thirty-second birthday, when surprised by early death. Louis, Santa Robert, was found drowned in the moat at the same fateful age, and thus down through the centuries ran the ominous chronicle. Henri's, Robert's, Antoine's, and Armand's snatched from happy and virtuous lives when little below the age of their unfortunate ancestor at his murder. That I had left at most but eleven years of further existence was made certain to me by the words which I read. My life, previously held at small value, now became dearer to me each day, as I delved deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the hidden world of black magic. Isolated as I was, modern science had produced no impression upon me, and I laboured as in the Middle Ages, as rapt as had been old Michel and young Charles themselves in the acquisition of demonological and alchemical learning. Yet read as I might, in no manner could I account for the strange curse upon my line. In unusually rational moments, I would even go so far as to seek a natural explanation, attributing the early deaths of my ancestors to the sinister Charles Le Sorcier and his heirs. Yet having found upon careful inquiry that there were no known descendants of the alchemist, I would fall back to occult studies, and once more endeavour to find a spell that would release my house from its terrible burden. Upon one thing I was absolutely resolved. I should never wed, 
for since no other branches of my family were in existence, I might thus end the curse with myself. As I drew near the age of thirty, old Pierre was called to the land beyond. Alone I buried him beneath the stones of the courtyard, about which he had loved to wander in life. Thus was I left to ponder on myself as the only human creature within the great fortress, and in my utter solitude my mind began to cease its vain protest against the impending doom, to become almost reconciled to the fate which so many of my ancestors had met. Much of my time was now occupied in the exploration of the ruined and abandoned halls and towers of the old chateau, which in youth fear had caused me to shun, and some of which, old Pierre had once told me, had not been trodden by human foot for over four centuries. Strange and awesome were many of the objects I encountered. Furniture, covered by the dust of ages and crumbling with the rot of long dampness, met my eyes. Cobwebs in a profusion never before seen by me were spun everywhere, and huge bats flapped their bony and uncanny wings on all sides of the otherwise untenanted gloom. Of my exact age, even down to days and hours, I kept a most careful record, for each movement of the pendulum of the massive clock in the library told off so much more of my doomed existence. At length I approached that time which I had so long viewed with apprehension. Since most of my ancestors had been seized some little while before they reached the exact age of Comte Henri at his end, I was every moment on the watch for the coming of the unknown death. In what strange form the curse should overtake me I knew not, but I was resolved at least that it should not find me a cowardly or a passive victim. With new vigour I applied myself to my examination of the old chateau and its contents. It was upon one of the longest of all my excursions of discovery, in the deserted portion of the castle, less than a week before that fatal hour which I felt must mark the utmost limit of my stay on earth, beyond which I could have not even the slightest hope of continuing to draw breath, that I came upon the culminating event of my whole life. I had spent the better part of the morning in climbing up and down half-ruined staircases in one of the most dilapidated of the ancient turrets. As the afternoon progressed, I sought the lower levels, descending into what appeared to be either a medieval place of confinement or a more recently excavated storehouse for gunpowder. As I slowly traversed the nitre-encrusted passageway at the foot of the last staircase, the paving became very damp and soon I saw by the light of my flickering torch that a blank, water-stained wall impeded my journey. Turning to retrace my steps, my eye fell upon a small trap-door with a ring, which lay directly beneath my feet. Pausing, I succeeded with difficulty in raising it, whereupon there was revealed a black aperture, exhaling noxious fumes which caused my torch to sputter, and disclosing in the unsteady glare the top of a flight of stone steps. As soon as the torch, which I lowered into the repellent depths, burned freely and steadily, I commenced my descent. The steps were many, and led to a narrow stone-flagged passage which I knew must be far underground. The passage proved of great length, and terminated in a massive oaken door, dripping with the moisture of the place, and stoutly resisting all my attempts to open it. Ceasing after a time my efforts in this direction, I had proceeded back some distance toward the steps, when there suddenly fell to my experience one of the most profound and maddening shocks capable of reception by the human mind. Without warning, I heard the heavy door behind me creak slowly open upon its rusted hinges. My immediate sensations are incapable of analysis to be confronted in a place as thoroughly deserted as I had deemed the old castle with evidence of the presence of man or spirit, produced in my brain a horror of the most acute description. When at last I turned and faced the seat of the sound, my eyes must have started from their orbits at the sight that they beheld. There, in the ancient Gothic doorway, stood a human figure. It was that of a man clad in a skull-cap, and long medieval tunic of dark colour. 
His long hair and flowing beard were of a terrible and intense black hue, and of incredible profusion. His forehead, high beyond the usual dimensions, his cheeks deep sunken and heavily lined with wrinkles, and his hands, long, claw-like, and gnarled, were of such a deathly, marble-like whiteness as I have never elsewhere seen in man. His figure, leaned to the proportions of a skeleton, was strangely bent and almost lost within the voluminous folds of his peculiar garment. But strangest of all were his eyes, twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degree of wickedness. These were now fixed upon me, piercing my soul with their hatred, and rooting me to the spot whereon I stood. At last, the figure spoke in a rumbling voice that chilled me through with its dull hollowness and latent malevolence. The language in which the discourse was clothed was that debased form of Latin in use amongst the more learned men of the Middle Ages, and made familiar to me by my prolonged researches into the works of the old alchemists and demonologists. The apparition spoke of the curse which had hovered over my house, told me of my coming end, dwelt on the wrong perpetrated by my ancestor against old Michel Mouvet, and gloated over the revenge of Charles Le Sorcier. He told how the young Charles had escaped into the night, returning in after years to kill Godfrey the heir with an arrow, just as he approached the age which had been his father's at his assassination. How he had secretly returned to the estate and established himself, unknown, in the even then deserted subterranean chamber whose doorway now framed the hideous narrator. How he had seized Robert, son of Godfrey, in a field, forced poison down his throat, and left him to die at the age of thirty-two, thus maintaining the foul provisions of his vengeful curse. At this point I was left to imagine the solution of the greatest mystery of all, how the curse had been fulfilled since that time when Charles Le Sorcier must in the course of nature have died, for the man digressed into an account of the deep, alchemical studies of the two wizards, father and son, speaking most particularly of the researches of Charles Le Sorcier concerning the elixir which should grant to him who partook of it eternal life and youth. His enthusiasm had seemed for the moment to remove from his terrible eyes the hatred that had at first so haunted them, but suddenly the fiendish glare returned and with a shocking sound like the hissing of a serpent, the stranger raised a glass phial with the evident intent of ending my life, as had Charles Le Sorcier six hundred years before, and did that of my ancestor. Prompted by some preserving instinct of self-defence, I broke through the spell that had hitherto held me immovable, and flung my now dying torch at the creature who menaced my existence. I heard the file break harmlessly against the stones of the passage, as the tunic of the strange man caught fire, and lit the horrid scene with a ghastly radiance. The shriek of fright and impotent malice emitted by the would-be assassin proved too much for my already shaken nerves, and I fell prone upon the slimy floor in a total faint. When at last my senses returned, all was frightfully dark and my mind, remembering what had occurred, shrank from the idea of beholding more. Yet curiosity overmastered all. Who, I asked myself, was this man of evil, and how came he within the castle walls? Why should he seek to avenge the death of poor Michel Mouvet? And how had the curse been carried on through all the long centuries, since the time of Charles Le Sorcier? The dread of years was lifted from my shoulders, for I knew that he whom I had felled was the source of all my danger from the curse. And now that I was free, I burned with the desire to learn more of the sinister thing which had haunted my line for centuries, and made of my own youth one long-continued nightmare. Determined upon further exploration, I felt in my pockets for flint and steel, and lit the unused torch which I had with me. First of all, the new light revealed the distorted and blackened form of the mysterious stranger. The hideous eyes were now closed. Disliking the sight, I turned away and entered the chamber beyond the Gothic door. Here I found what seemed much like an alchemist's laboratory, 
In one corner was an immense pile of a shining yellow metal that sparkled gorgeously in the light of the torch. It may have been gold, but I did not pause to examine it, for I was strangely affected by that which I had undergone. At the farther end of the apartment was an opening leading out into one of the many wild ravines of the dark hillside forest, filled with wonder, yet now realizing how the man had obtained access to the chateau, I proceeded to return. I had intended to pass by the remains of the stranger with averted face, but as I approached the body, I seemed to hear emanating from it a faint sound, as though life were not yet wholly extinct. Aghast, I turned to examine the charred and shriveled figure on the floor. Then all at once, the horrible eyes, blacker even than the seared face in which they were set, opened wide with an expression which I was unable to interpret. The cracked lips tried to frame words which I could not well understand. Once I caught the name of Charles Le Sorcier, and again I fancied that the words years and curse issued from the twisted mouth. Still, I was at a loss to gather the purport of his disconnected speech. At my evident ignorance of his meaning, the pitchy eyes once more flashed malevolently at me, until, helpless as I saw my opponent to be, I trembled as I watched him. Suddenly the wretch, animated with his last burst of strength, raised his hideous head from the damp and sunken pavement. Then, as I remained, paralyzed with fear, he found his voice, and in his dying breath screamed forth those words which have ever afterward haunted my days and my nights. Fool! he shrieked. Can you not guess my secret? Have you no brain whereby you may recognize the will which has through six long centuries fulfilled the dreadful curse upon your house? Have I not told you of the great elixir of eternal life? Know you not how the secret of alchemy was solved? I tell you, it is I, 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 that have lived for six hundred years to maintain my revenge, for I am Charles Le Sorcier. By H. P. Lovecraft and Duane W. Rimmel. I awoke abruptly from a horrible dream and stared wildly about. Then, seeing the high arched ceiling and the narrow stained windows of my friend's room, a flood of uneasy revelation coursed over me, and I knew that all of Andrew's hopes had been realized. I lay supine in a large bed, the post of which reared upward in dizzy perspective while on vast shelves about the chamber were the familiar books and antiques I was accustomed to seeing in that secluded corner of the crumbling and ancient mansion which had formed our joint home for many years. On a table by the wall stood a huge candelabrum of early workmanship and design, and the usual light window curtains had been replaced by hangings of sombre black, which took on a faint, ghostly luster in the dying light. I recalled forcibly the events preceding my confinement and seclusion in this veritable medieval fortress. They were not pleasant, and I shuddered anew when I remembered the couch that had held me before my tenancy of the present one, the couch that everyone supposed would be my last. Memory burned afresh regarding those hideous circumstances which had compelled me to choose between a true death and a hypothetical one, with a later reanimation by therapeutic methods known only to my comrade, Marshal Andrews. The whole thing had begun when I returned from the Orient a year before, and discovered, to my utter horror, that I had contracted leprosy while abroad. I had known that I was taking grave chances in caring for my stricken brother in the Philippines, but no hint of my own affliction appeared until I returned to my native land. Andrews himself had made the discovery, and kept it from me as long as possible, but our close acquaintance soon disclosed the awful truth— at once I was quartered in our ancient abode atop the crags overlooking crumbling Hampton, from whose musty halls and quaint arched doorways I was never permitted to go forth. It was a terrible existence, with the yellow shadow hanging constantly over me, yet my friend never faltered in his faith, 
taking care not to contract the dread scourge, but meanwhile making life as pleasant and comfortable as possible. His widespread, though somewhat sinister fame as a surgeon, prevented any authority from discovering my plight and shipping me away. It was after nearly a year of this seclusion, late in August, that Andrews decided on a trip to the West Indies, to study native medical methods, he said. I was left in care of venerable Seamers, the household factotum. So far, no outward signs of the disease had developed, and I enjoyed a tolerable, though almost completely private existence, during my colleague's absence. It was during this time that I read many of the tomes Andrews had acquired in the course of his twenty years as a surgeon, and learned why his reputation, though locally of the highest, was just a bit shady, for the volumes included any number of fanciful subjects, hardly related to modern medical knowledge, treatises, and unauthoritative articles on monstrous experiments in surgery, accounts of the bizarre effects of glandular transplantation and rejuvenation in animals and men alike, brochures on attempted brain transference, and a host of other fanatical speculations not countenanced by orthodox physicians. It appeared, too, that Andrews was an authority on obscure medicaments, some of the few books I waded through revealing that he had spent much time in chemistry, and in the search for new drugs which might be used as aids in surgery. Looking back at those studies now, I find them hellishly suggestive when associated with his later experiments. Andrews was gone longer than I expected, returning early in November, almost four months later, and when he did arrive, I was quite anxious to see him, since my condition was at last on the brink of becoming noticeable. I had reached a point where I must seek absolute privacy to keep from being discovered, but my anxiety was slight as compared with his exuberance over a certain new plan he had hatched while in the Indies, a plan to be carried out with the aid of a curious drug he had learned of from a native doctor in Haiti. When he explained that his idea concerned me, I became somewhat alarmed, though in my position there could be little to make my plight worse. I had, indeed, considered more than once the oblivion that would come with a revolver or a plunge from the roof to the jagged rocks below. On the day after his arrival, in the seclusion of the dimly lit study, he outlined the whole grisly scheme. He had found in Haiti a drug, the formula for which he would develop later, which induced a state of profound sleep in anyone taking it, a trance so deep that death was closely counterfeited, with all muscular reflexes, even the respiration and heartbeat, completely stilled for the time being. Andrews had, he said, seen it demonstrated on natives many times. Some of them remained somnolent for days at a time, wholly immobile and as such like death as death itself. This suspended animation, he explained further, would even pass the closest examination of any medical man. He himself, according to all known laws, would have to report as dead a man under the influence of such a drug. He stated, too, that the subject's body assumed the precise appearance of a corpse, even a slight rigor mortis developing in prolonged cases. For some time, his purpose did not seem wholly clear, but when the full import of his words became apparent, I felt weak and nauseated. Yet, in another way, I was relieved, for the thing meant at least a partial escape from my curse, an escape from the banishment and shame of an ordinary death of the dread leprosy. Briefly, his plan was to administer a strong dose of the drug to me, and call the local authorities, who would immediately pronounce me dead, and see that I was buried within a very short while. He felt assured that, with their careless examination, they would fail to notice my leprosy symptoms, which in truth had hardly appeared. Only a trifle over fifteen months had passed since I had caught the disease, whereas the corruption takes seven years to run its entire course. Later, he said, would come resurrection. After my interment in the family graveyard, beside my century dwelling and barely a quarter mile from his own ancient pile, the appropriate steps would be taken. Finally, when my estate was settled and my decease widely known, he would secretly open the tomb and bring me to his own abode again, still alive and none the worse for my adventure. It seemed a ghastly and daring plan, but to me it offered the only hope for even a partial freedom, so I accepted his proposition, but not without a myriad of misgivings. What if the effect of the drug should wear off while I was in my tomb? What if the coroner should discover the awful ruse and fail to inter me? These were some of the hideous doubts which assailed me before the experiment. Though death would have been a release from my curse, I feared it even worse than the yellow scourge, feared it even when I could see its black wings constantly hovering over me. 
Fortunately, I was spared the horror of viewing my own funeral and burial rites. They must, however, have gone just as Andrews had planned, even to the subsequent disinterment, for after the initial dose of the poison from Haiti, I lapsed into a semi-paralytic state, and from that to a profound night-black sleep. The drug had been administered in my room, and Andrews had told me before giving it that he would recommend to the coroner a verdict of heart failure due to nerve strain. Of course, there was no embalming, Andrews saw to that, and the whole procedure leading up to my secret transportation from the graveyard to his crumbling manor covered a period of three days. Having been buried late in the afternoon of the third day, my body was secured by Andrews that very night. He had replaced the fresh sod, just as it had been when the workmen left. Old Simez, sworn to secrecy, had helped Andrews in his ghoulish task. Later, I had lain for over a week in my old familiar bed. Owing to some unexpected effect of the drug, my whole body was completely paralyzed, so that I could move my head only slightly. All my senses, however, were fully alert, and by another week's time I was able to take nourishment in good quantities. Andrews explained that my body would gradually regain its former sensibilities, though, owing to the presence of the leprosy, it might take considerable time. He seemed greatly interested in analyzing my daily symptoms, and always asked if there was any feeling present in my body. Many days passed before I was able to control any part of my anatomy, and much longer before the paralysis crept from my enfeebled limbs so that I could feel the ordinary bodily reactions. Lying and staring at my numb hulk was like having it injected with a perpetual anaesthetic. There was a total alienation I could not understand, considering that my head and neck were quite alive and in good health. Andrews explained that he had revived my upper half first, and could not account for the complete bodily paralysis, though my condition seemed to trouble him little, considering the damnably intent interest he centred upon my reactions and stimuli from the very beginning. Many times during lulls in our conversation, I would catch a strange gleam in his eyes as he viewed me on the couch, a glint of victorious exultation which, queerly enough, he never voiced aloud though he seemed to be quite glad that I had run the gauntlet of death and had come through alive. Still, there was that horror I was to meet in less than six years, which added to my desolation and melancholy during the tedious days in which I awaited the return of normal bodily functions. But I would be up and about, he assured me, before very long, enjoying an existence few men had ever experienced. The words did not, however, impress me with their true and ghastly meaning— until many days later. During that awful siege in bed, Andrews and I became somewhat estranged. He no longer treated me so much like a friend as like an implement in his skilled and greedy fingers. I found him possessed of unexpected traits, little examples of baseness and cruelty, apparent even to the hardened seamers, which disturbed me in a most unusual manner. Often, he would display extraordinary cruelty to live specimens in his laboratory, for he was constantly carrying on various hidden projects in glandular and muscular transplantation on guinea pigs and rabbits. He had also been employing his newly discovered sleeping potion in curious experiments with suspended animation. But of these things he told me very little, though old Simez often let slip chance comments which shed some light on the proceedings. I was not certain how much the old servant knew— but he had surely learned considerable, being a constant companion to both Andrews and myself. With the passage of time, a slow but consistent feeling began creeping into my disabled body and at the reviving symptoms. Andrews took a fanatical interest in my case. He still seemed more coldly analytical than sympathetic toward me, taking my pulse and heartbeat with more than usual zeal. Occasionally, in his fevered examinations, I saw his hands tremble slightly, an uncommon sight with so skilled a surgeon, but he seemed oblivious of my scrutiny. I was never allowed even a momentary glimpse of my full body, but with a feeble return of the sense of touch, I was aware of a bulk and heaviness, which at first seemed awkward and unfamiliar. Gradually, I regained the use of my hands and arms, and with the passing of the paralysis came a new and terrible sensation of physical estrangement— my limbs had difficulty in following the commands of my mind, and every movement was jerky and uncertain. 
So clumsy were my hands that I had to become accustomed to them all over again. This must, I thought, be due to my disease and the advance of the contagion in my system. Being unaware of how the early symptoms affected the victim, my brother's being a more advanced case, I had no means of judging, and since Andrew shunned the subject, I deemed it better to remain silent. One day I asked Andrews, I no longer considered him a friend, if I might try rising and sitting up in bed. At first he objected strenuously, but later, after cautioning me to keep the blankets well up around my chin so that I would not be chilled, he permitted it. This seemed strange, in view of the comfortable temperature. Now that late autumn was slowly turning into winter, the room was always well heated. A growing chilliness at night and occasional glimpses of a leaden sky through the window had told me of the changing season, for no calendar was ever in sight upon the dingy walls. With the gentle help of Seamers, I was eased to a sitting position, Andrews coldly watching from the door to the laboratory. At my success, a slow smile spread across his leering features, and he turned to disappear from the darkened doorway. His mood did nothing to improve my condition. Old Seamers, usually so regular and consistent, was now often late in his duties, sometimes leaving me alone for hours at a time. The terrible sense of alienation was heightened by my new position. It seemed that the legs and arms inside my gown were hardly able to follow the summoning of my mind, and it became mentally exhausting to continue movement for any length of time. My fingers, woefully clumsy, were wholly unfamiliar to my inner sense of touch, and I wondered vaguely if I were to be accursed the rest of my days with an awkwardness induced by my dread malady. It was on the evening following my half-recovery that the dreams began. I was tormented, not only at night, but during the day as well. I would awaken, screaming horribly, from some frightful nightmare I dared not think about outside the realm of sleep. These dreams consisted mainly of ghoulish things, graveyards at night, stalking corpses and lost souls amid a chaos of blinding light and shadow. The terrible reality of the visions disturbed me most of all. It seemed that some inside influence was inducing the grisly vistas of moonlit tombstones and endless catacombs of the restless dead. I could not place their source, and at the end of a week I was quite frantic with abominable thoughts which seemed to obtrude themselves upon my unwelcome consciousness. By that time a slow plan was forming, whereby I might escape the living hell into which I had been propelled. Andrews cared less and less about me, seeming intent only on my progress and growth, and recovery of normal muscular reactions. I was becoming every day more convinced of the nefarious doings going on in that laboratory across the threshold. The animal cries were shocking, and rasped hideously on my overwrought nerves. And I was gradually beginning to think that Andrews had not saved me from deportation solely for my own benefit, but for some accursed reason of his own. Seamez's attention was slowly becoming slighter and slighter, and I was convinced that the aged servitor had a hand in the deviltry somewhere. Andrews no longer eyed me as a friend, but as an object of experimentation, nor did I like the way he fingered his scalpel when he stood in the narrow doorway and stared at me with crafty alertness. I had never before seen such a transformation come over any man. His ordinarily handsome features were now lined and whisker-grown, and his eyes gleamed as if some imp of Satan was staring from them. His cold, calculating gaze made me shudder horribly, and gave me a fresh determination to free myself from his bondage as soon as possible. I had lost track of time during my dream orgy, and had no way of knowing how fast the days were passing. The curtains were often drawn in the daytime, the room being lit by waxen cylinders in the large candelabrum. It was a nightmare of living horror and unreality, though through it all I was gradually becoming stronger. I always gave careful responses to Andrew's inquiries concerning my returning physical control, concealing the fact that a new life was vibrating through me with every passing day, an altogether strange sort of strength, but one which I was counting on to serve me in the coming crisis. Finally, one chilly evening when the candles had been extinguished, and a pale shaft of moonlight fell through the dark curtains upon my bed, I determined to rise and carry out my plan of action. There had been no movement from either of my captors for several hours, and I was confident that both were asleep in adjoining bedchambers. 
Shifting my cumbersome weight carefully, I rose to a sitting position and crawled cautiously out of bed, down upon the floor. A vertigo gripped me momentarily, and a wave of weakness flooded my entire being. But finally, strength returned, and by clutching at a bedpost, I was able to stand upon my feet for the first time in many months. Gradually, a new strength coursed through me, and I donned the dark robe which I had seen hanging on a nearby chair. It was quite long, but served as a cloak over my nightdress. Again came that feeling of awful unfamiliarity which I had experienced in bed, that sense of alienation, and of difficulty in making my limbs perform as they should. But there was need for haste before my feeble strength might give out. As a last precaution in dressing, I slipped some old shoes over my feet, but though I could have sworn they were my own, they seemed abnormally loose, so that I decided they must belong to the aged seamers. Seeing no other heavy objects in the room, I seized from the table the huge candelabrum, upon which the moon shone with a pallid glow, and proceeded very quietly toward the laboratory door. My first steps came jerkily, and with much difficulty, and in the semi-darkness I was unable to make my way very rapidly. When I reached the threshold, a glance within revealed my former friend, seated in a large overstuffed chair, while beside him was a smoking-stand, upon which were assorted bottles and a glass. He reclined halfway in the moonlight through the large window, and his greasy features were creased in a drunken smirk. An opened book lay in his lap, one of the hideous tomes from his private library. For a long moment, I gloated over the prospect before me, and then, stepping forward suddenly, I brought the heavy weapon down upon his unprotected head. The dull crunch was followed by a spurt of blood, and the fiend crumpled to the floor, his head laid half open. I felt no contrition at taking the man's life in such a manner. In the hideous, half-visible specimens of his surgical wizardry scattered about the room in various stages of completion and preservation, I felt there was enough evidence to blast his soul without my aid. Andrews had gone too far in his practices to continue living, and as one of his monstrous specimens, of that I was now hideously certain, it was my duty to exterminate him. Seamers, I realized, would be no such easy matter. Indeed, only unusual good fortune had caused me to find Andrews unconscious. When I finally reeled up to the servant's bedchamber door, faint from exhaustion, I knew it would take all my remaining strength to complete the ordeal. The old man's room was in utmost darkness, being on the north side of the structure, but he must have seen me silhouetted in the doorway as I came in. He screamed hoarsely, and I aimed the candelabrum at him from the threshold. It struck something soft, making a slothing sound in the darkness, but the screaming continued. From that time on, events became hazy and jumbled together, but I remember grappling with the man and choking the life from him little by little. He gibbered a host of awful things before I could lay hands on him, cried and begged for mercy from my clutching fingers. I hardly realized my own strength in that mad moment, which left Andrew's associate in a condition like his own. Retreating from the darkened chamber, I stumbled for the stairway door, sagged through it, and somehow reached the landing below. No lamps were burning, and my only light was a filtering of moonbeams coming from the narrow windows in the hall. But I made my jerky way over the cold, damp slabs of stone, reeling from the terrible weakness of my exertion, and reached the front door after ages of fumbling and crawling about in the darkness. Vague memories and haunting shadows came to taunt me in that ancient hallway, Shadows once friendly and understandable, but now grown alien and unrecognizable, so that I stumbled down the worn steps in a frenzy of something more than fear. For a moment, I stood in the shadow of the giant stone manor, viewing the moonlit trail down which I must go to reach the home of my forefathers, only a quarter of a mile distant. But the way seemed long, and for a while I despaired of ever traversing the whole of it. At last, I grasped a piece of dead wood as a cane, and set out down the winding road. Ahead, seemingly only a few rods away in the moonlight, stood the venerable mansion where my ancestors had lived and died. Its turrets rose spectrally in the shimmering radiance, and the black shadow cast on the beetling hillside appeared to shift and waver, as if belonging to a castle of unreal substance. There stood the monument of half a century— a haven for all my family, old and young, 
which I had deserted many years ago to live with the fanatical Andrews. It stood empty on that fateful night, and I hope that it may always remain so. In some manner I reached the aged place, though I do not remember the last half of the journey at all. It was enough to be near the family cemetery, among whose moss-covered and crumbling stones I would seek the oblivion I had desired. As I approached the moonlit spot, the old familiarity, so absent during my abnormal existence, returned to plague me in a wholly unexpected way. I drew close to my own tombstone, and the feeling of homecoming grew stronger. With it came a fresh flood of that awful sense of alienation and disembodiment which I knew so well. I was satisfied that the end was drawing near, nor did I stop to analyze emotions till a little later, when the full horror of my position burst upon me. Intuitively, I knew my own tombstone, for the grass had scarcely begun to grow between the pieces of sod. With feverish haste, I began clawing at the mound, and scraping the wet earth from the hole left by the removal of the grass and roots. How long I worked in the nitrous soil before my fingers struck the coffin lid, I can never say. But sweat was pouring from me, and my nails were but useless, bleeding hooks. At last, I threw out the last bit of loose earth, and with trembling fingers tugged on the heavy lid. It gave a trifle, and I was prepared to lift it completely open, when a fetid and nauseous odour assailed my nostrils. I started erect, horrified. Had some idiot placed my tombstone on the wrong grave, causing me to unearth another body? For surely there could be no mistaking that awful stench. Gradually, a hideous uncertainty came over me, and I scrambled from the hole. One look at the newly made headpiece was enough. This was indeed my own grave, but what fool had buried within it another corpse? All at once, a bit of the unspeakable truth propelled itself upon my brain. The odour, in spite of its putrescence, seemed somehow familiar, horribly familiar, yet I could not credit my senses with such an idea. Reeling and cursing, I fell into the black cavity once more, and by the aid of a hastily lit match, lifted the long lid completely open. Then the light went out, as if extinguished by a malignant hand, and I clawed my way out of that accursed pit, screaming in a frenzy of fear and loathing. When I regained consciousness, I was lying before the door of my own ancient manor, where I must have crawled after that hideous rendezvous in the family cemetery. I realized that dawn was close at hand, and rose feebly, opening the aged portal before me, and entering the place which had known no footsteps for over a decade. A fever was ravaging my weakened body, so that I was hardly able to stand, but I made my way slowly through the musty, dimly lit chambers, and staggered into my own study, the study I had deserted so many years before. When the sun has risen, I shall go to the ancient well beneath the old willow tree by the cemetery, and cast my deformed self into it. No other man shall ever view this blasphemy, which has survived life longer than it should have. I do not know what people will say when they see my disordered grave, but this will not trouble me, if I can find oblivion from that which I beheld amidst the crumbling, moss-crusted stones of the hideous place. I know now why Andrews was so secretive in his actions, so damnably gloating in his attitude toward me, after my artificial death. He had meant me for a specimen all the time, a specimen of his greatest feat of surgery, his masterpiece of unclean witchery, an example of perverted artistry for him alone to see. Where Andrews obtained that other with which I lay accursed in his mouldering mansion, I shall probably never know, but I am afraid that it was brought from Haiti along with his fiendish medicine. At least these long hairy arms and horrible short legs are alien to me, alien to all natural and sane laws of mankind. The thought that I shall be tortured with that other during the rest of my brief existence is another hell. Now I can but wish for that which once was mine, that which every man blessed of God ought to have at death, that which I saw in that awful moment in the ancient burial ground when I raised the lid on the coffin, my own shrunken, decayed, and headless body.
If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.